thank you everyone here for all of you to come here to listen to whatever I have my, in my mind and thank you all the people who have running such a wonderful institution, uh, Kakatiya Government College. I was told that you got 3,500 students here studying in sciences, social sciences, humanities, really amazing, multi-dimensional institution uh, and I really feel honored. I'm just cross-checking. I'm the same person who's shown here, the same color. <laughs> My color has not changed. Uh, I thank you, Madhu Suranji, for introducing this elaborate introduction which you gave. Um, I myself forgotten most of the things which you told. But there's one small correction which I want to make. The work which we started in Hoshangabad district in 1972 through an institution called Kishore Bharati. You referred to as an NGO. We were never an NGO. And we were never want to be an NGO. I want to very clearly make it. We were a voluntary body which was not an NGO. There is an important difference between voluntary body and an NGO. That difference I will not talk about right now. But please recognize the difference. NGOs are on a neoliberal path. The voluntary bodies are for transforming Indian society and Indian polity. There's a total difference between the two. Um, you also mentioned that I was national convener of uh, Bharat Jan Vikyan Jatha, which is true. But it is not true that I am national convener of All India People's Science Network. All India People's Science Network was a parallel and a federal organization in early 1990s. Bharat Jan Vikyan Jatha, All India People's Science Network worked together for a common objective of bringing scientific temper in society and using science for development of rural development, uh, introducing new ideas in, in our country. So we were parallel and fraternal institutions work to, working together. With these two minor um, uh, rectifications, I wish to proceed further on the uh, issue which I myself listed in the title of my talk which you find it here, the paradigm shift in uh, undergraduate education, uh, which I want to talk about. Uh, let me preface my talk with one uh, acknowledgement. When uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gangadhar approached me with a request on behalf of science for, for change in education, uh, that you please speak on undergraduate education. So I had great difficulty in agreeing to it, not because of anything wrong being the title of the proposed talk, but because I have never spoken on undergraduate education in my life. I must have given more than 100 lectures on education, but undergraduate education I have never spoken about. So I did not know how to prepare myself for today. Then it occurred to me, once upon a time, I was an undergraduate student. And what was my experience when I was an undergraduate student? That should be the beginning of my thought. And that helped me a lot. So I thought about my experiences, some happy experiences, some unhappy experiences. I recalled my teachers, some very inspiring, some were just the opposite of inspiring, they discouraged me. So all that experience was very important for me. So keeping that in my background, I prepared myself. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with this question to myself and to you. What is the vision and mission of undergraduate education? Undergraduate education is preceded by a secondary and senior secondary school education. And as you know, Secondary and senior secondary school education is the first stage in is the first stage when a student or a child has to face a formal, almost threatening board examination, which threatens all the students. If you fail, then you fail in your life. And if you have to pass, you can use all the kinds of tricks. You can copy the things and you can play the tricks of now with social media in order to pass board examinations. It's under that pressure that students at that very tender age of adolescence, from 16 years of onwards, 
they are able to face the uh, board examination of 10th class and 12th class. You all and we all have gone through it, through the very difficult times. And uh, we were in happier times in 1950s when we were doing our 10th and 12th class examination. Because that time, getting a good second class was considered wonderful. Today, if I was a student, I would have failed. Because I, now if you do not come in the top, um, top 5 percentile or 100 percent marks, you are no good. In our days, a good second division was worth it in our lives. Those are different times. Those were before the neoliberal attack on Indian economy, Indian society and Indian education. Long before that. And those, that, was a, that was also the time when we were still feeling the inspiration of the freedom struggle and the newly gained independence and the formation of Republic of India. Those were times of our doing 10th class and 12th class examination. Uh, the important point which I want to make that from uh, that stage of education to undergraduate on way to become a postgraduate student, there are very important changes have taking place. Undergraduate education is like a sandwich between senior secondary and postgraduate. So let us try to understand what are the major differences stage-wise. In secondary and senior secondary, you're bound by the curriculum and board examination. You cannot step out of that. Undergraduate education is a step towards postgraduate education. Now, undergraduate education, if it becomes a copycat of senior secondary, then we have not made any progress. Undergraduate education should open up the doors of knowledge as widely as possible, which you will be able to access then in postgraduate education. And onwards if you want to become an MPhil scholar or a PhD scholar. If undergraduate education does not play this role, then it's not preparing us properly for opening up the doors of knowledge to global knowledge. This is a problem with the undergraduate education. I do not know whether, whether it is a problem in Kakatiya Government College or not, that I do not know. I'm talking in general terms. Uh, more often than not, in most of the colleges in the country, uh, there are thousands of colleges in our country and universities giving undergraduate education. Undergraduate education is like Macaulay's paradigm. Macaulay was sent by East India Company to advise East India Company with headquarters in Calcutta in 1835 how to build the Indian education system. And in my opinion, Indian education system has not been able to come out of the, the framework which Macaulay gave to us. And Macaulay's framework was that East India Company will define what you should learn and what you should not learn. East India Company will define the framework also, how to learn. All that was prescribed through prescribed textbooks and prescribed examination system. And no college and no education institution during Macaulay's time could come out of it. And today, we have not clearly moved much forward beyond Macaulay. So I'll say the Macaulay framework, which continues to guide and dictate terms to our college education, is, uh, the, is, pa is part of the Macaulay paradigm, which can be also understood and visioned as an instruction-based paradigm, an instruction paradigm. As I grew up learning about education during my uh, early years of 1970s, building up Hoshangabad science teaching program in village schools, government village schools, it occurred to me that instruction-based um, uh, education limits us tremendously. I was uh, fortunate to be shown by a comrade a, a written piece from uh, Gandhi, I think it's part of Hind Swaraj, uh, where Gandhi questions the use of textbook, prescribed textbooks in education. And Gandhi writes in his typical style that textbooks destroy the imagination of the teachers. Textbooks become obstruction between the children eager to learn and the teacher eager to teach. It takes you back instead of taking you forward. And therefore, textbooks should be banned from school system. 
and teachers and students should be left to learn from each other. Learn from each other. Not, not that only students are learning. If there's, a, if there's a genuine learning process going on, the teachers will learn probably more than the students learning by establishing an open-ended dialogue and discourse with the children. Nothing like this happens in majority of our colleges. Because we are bound by the Macaulayan framework of instruction-based. Instruction is a very bad word in education. I mean, a very horrible word. Therefore, whenever I was uh, learning about medium of education, I, I always saw medium of instruction. In government policy documents also, whether 86 policy or uh, 90s policy, or 90, 92 policy, or the policy, uh, Sarva Shiksha Abhyan of uh, late 19, uh, just beginning of 2000 or end of the 90s decade, or NEP 2020, they all talk about instruction. It's a horrible word. I've never been able to digest. So I started talking about medium of education, medium of expression, medium of articulation. There's no instruction involved. Instruction, in fact, takes away your imagination, your creativity. And children are very creative people. Children are probably the most creative people of the world. As we grow, in our age, we lose our creativity. It's that creativity which should be at the very focus and the center of any program of learning. So from instruction-based paradigm, we must shift to learning-based paradigm. When learning is at the center of any education program. And how do you learn? You do not learn by rote learning. You do not learn by listening to a lecture by a teacher who is supposed to be source of all knowledge. If teacher is teaching, you better take all the notes. Don't apply your mind to see whether notes are correct or not, whether notes are actually logical or not. These are unnecessary things because whatever teacher is teaching, you have to absorb. Because tomorrow, the same teacher may be examining you in your undergraduate examination. So you better absorb everything. I had a problem with this, this paradigm of instruction-based learning, instruction-based teaching in my undergraduate education as a student of BSc in biology in Delhi University. Um, I remember my teacher uh, was teaching us something about metabolism of fat. I'm taking example from science, but I'll take example from social sciences as well soon. The teaching about fat metabolism and it seemed very boring and very complicated and beyond our understanding, and very boring. We are writing lots of formula by looking at his notebook. We had a notebook in a very bad, tattered shape. I knew that this is from maybe 10 years old notebook in his hand, and reading from that and writing on the blackboard. In the evening, after the formal part of my course was over in the evening, I walked into the central library of Delhi University and started looking at whatever material in this area of uh, fat, fat which is in our body, which is always told, which we are told by the doctors, bad to have a lot of fat, you should reduce your fat. I'm talking that fat. So uh, I inquired from the library in charge, where can I read something about fat metabolism? So he said, I do not know so much about it, but there is a very good magazine coming from the United States called Scientific American that covers all the latest researches going on. Would you like to read it? I said, sure. So he gave me a copy of the latest, uh, latest issue of Scientific American. And I was so happy, the very first article, very nicely produced with lots of uh, color diagrams and um, very interesting headings given to each paragraph. And uh, that was a fact matter of metabolism. And the author of the article was introduced as a person who got a Nobel Prize one year, one year before this Scientific American issue. One year before, I was very excited. So I read the whole article, and next day in the class, when the same teacher came to teach us the next chapter of whatever was in his notebook, I said, sir, I have a problem. What you taught uh, yesterday, I think it must be not less than 15 year old work in science. Because I have now read the Nobel Prize winning essay on this subject. And he was becoming very disturbed. He said, well, I'm, that is out of course. We are not talking about that. I said, sir, you are talking about fat metabolism. Why should we learn something which is 15 years old? He said, look, don't teach me anything. He was very angry at me. 
I am holding in my hand the notebook of 1935 when I was a student at your age. I said, sir, we are talking in 1957. We are talking in 1935. Whole science has undergone a change. But he did not allow me. And after a while, there was an examination, test, and I wrote about fat metabolism. I remember I got a zero. That's my real experience. On that day, I decided to rebel against the way method of being taught. I rebelled in that age. I was 17 years old. I rebelled against it. I keep rebelling even today, questioning all traditional methods of teaching and fighting to change all of that. Uh, this is one uh, experience which I wanted to share. Um, there was a very constructive, positive experience also at the same time. Delhi University at that time, just you know, a few years after independence, was very keen on adopting new ideas. So one of the ideas introduced in 1957 onwards was that the PhD scholars in every department, social sciences and sciences, were given some, I think, some honorarium to take once a week um, um, some kind of a tutorial course. So, so that PhD students will also get to meet undergraduate students and uh, together they will uh, do a tutorial program. So two of us in our undergraduate class, BSc class, were told that you, uh, a lady professor called Professor Manju will be your tutor. tutor. So in our very first meeting, sitting in a room, the two of us and her, uh, she asked us, what do, you, what do you want me to do uh, with you in this uh, class, what, in this tutorial class? I said, we do not know. No, you any idea what you what do you want me to focus upon? So I said, can you t tell us what is the latest in biology going on in the world? She said, sure, that's a very exciting idea. And she, this is in 1957 or 58, she started talking about DNA to us, which was not part of her course, not, we never heard the word DNA at that time. And she started making diagram of DNA, started teaching us the chemistry. I do not know where she learned all this from. And then she talked about the new experiment going on to decode the DNA's genetic code. It's now a very big thing, a genetic code. And she said, uh, are you interested? We both said, uh, another classmate of mine was a Bengali. We both said, of course, madam, we want to learn all this. She said, don't tell it to any faculty member here because they'll hate me for introducing DNA in genetic code. Keep it only between me and you. And lo and behold, few years later, I, after finishing my MSc program, I went to California Institute of Technology to work on DNA in genetic code because of the inspiration given by Professor Mandi. She really opened up the whole thing for us. Amazing. We knew only the traditional way of looking at biology. Here was a most ultra modern, latest methodology, latest pedagogy of decoding biology itself. A very exciting experience. I've never forgotten that in my life. And I can never forget that uh, uh, Professor Manju, whose face I remember, but I do not know where she is. Um, with this